Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk to us about the first match they ever attended or maybe even played in. Because it's important today, I'm your host Richard Foster, but I'm absolutely delighted to say I've got Adrian Clark with me. Adrian is a journalist and broadcaster who's a regular contributor to the Premier League website. He works on TalkSport as well as for the Arsenal Football Club. And the reason it's a good connection is he spent six years as a player uh, between 1991 and 97. And those of you lucky enough to watch the YouTube video, you can see over Adrian's shoulder his shirt, number 29. <laughs> uh, Adrian has an excellent understanding of each level of English league football because he's appeared at nearly every level of English league football in the pyramid, all the way from the Premier League down to the Isthmian Premier Division, Tier 7. Uh, in the last week, Adrian made his co-coms debut on Sky Sports at the New Den, of all places, for Millwall Watford, which was quite a game, and we'll touch on that later. So, Adrian, a really warm welcome to the show. And before Hello, we go Richard. into your... Hi, good, good to <laughs> see. Before we go into your playing debut... Let's have a little talk about the very first match that you actually attended when you were, I believe, about six years old, and it was <laughs> at Portman Road. Tell us about this. It was, yeah. Look, I, I grew up in Suffolk, a place called Haverhill, um, but at the other end of, of Suffolk is, is Ipswich, and and yeah, I was a I was an Ipswich Town supporter. I, I, really, it's only because of living in Suffolk. My dad was a Spurs fan, believe it or not. Oh, so really? when, I joined oh, Arsenal, <laughs> when I joined Arsenal later on, it, yeah, I'm not sure how happy he was at the outset. <laughs> but <laughs> um but yeah we um yeah we sort of adopted Ipswich Town and I was a junior blue. So oh, yeah okay. I sort of um joined that sort of membership club so you get sent uh, signed photos and things like that. And yeah I loved Ipswich and and it was a great time to support Ipswich Town because it was yeah. It was the best period in the club's history. There's no, there's no doubt about that under mm. Sir Bobby Robson or just playing Bobby Robson at the time. And yeah. and yeah, yeah, it was it was the 1980-81 season, a, a campaign I think Ipswich ended up finishing runners up in uh, in the yeah. top flight. So you know, this is that's as close as Ipswich have ever been, I think, to becoming champions of England. And um, they had a wonderful team. It's a who's who of of names of Ipswich legends that, that were in the squad that year. And yeah, yeah, I was six years of age and, and mum and dad took me along to Ipswich versus Wolves. It was a yeah, February afternoon and um, yeah, luckily Ipswich won 1-3-1, one, 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 mm -hmm. which was uh, which was nice because you always want to go and see a win on your first, first ever yeah. match for the team yeah. you support. Um, and yeah, look, the names the, the, the names trip off the tongue. For for for, pe for listeners of a certain vintage, they'll know yes. Johnny Walk, they'll know Paul Mariner, Eric Gates, Terry Butcher, Russell Osman, Paul Cooper in goal, really small goalkeeper, but excellent. Yeah. And uh, Arnold Muir and uh, others too. So yeah, it was it was fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's one of those moments that does live with you forever, doesn't it? It does indeed. And, you know, as you say, for the younger listeners... I think it's worth pointing out that Arnold Muren was one of the first, well, certainly one of the first Dutch players, but one of the first from outside the British Isles to really establish himself yeah. within the top flight. And as you say, Ipswich were in a great place at this time. Bobby Robson had taken them from being OK to being right at the top of the ladder. You're right in saying, unfortunately, they just got pipped to the Tiger by Aston Villa. But when I looked at that season, unfortunately for Ipswich, had been on a great run, which included your 3-1 win in February, but then suddenly dropped off and they actually lost seven of their last 10 games and lost out to Aston Villa by four points. So if they kept going, you could have <laughs> yeah. seen the champions of England. But oh, that a, would have been a, nice. a couple of others that I'd like to pick out and you've mentioned there. So John Walk. Yes. Fabulous player. He was actually the leading scorer for Ipswich. And this season, he scored 18 in the league, 36 overall. A lot in the UEFA Cup, which we'll come up onto in a little bit. But John Walk was a midfield player. And I know he took penalties, but that's quite an achievement to be the top scorer. Do you remember him that day as a, you know, because he had a great 
presence. He had a fantastic yeah. moustache often. So is he someone who impressed on you? I know you were sick, so it's difficult yeah. to remember, but is that someone who you, you suddenly thought, yes? A hundred percent. Yeah, you, you've you've picked the right angle there because from that day onwards, John Walker was my favourite player. He was all, oh, right. you know, okay, he was good. he was the one that I that, that I loved the most. You know, I, I you know I like them all, but yeah, Johnny Walk with that striking, uh, big moustache, tall, mm. uh, box to box midfielder, um, who basically could do it all. He could sort of crunch into tackles. He could he could pass, but his forte was to crash the box. And to yeah. score goals, and whether that was headers or or, or 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 shots, he was equally good. He had a really powerful shot, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, what a record that is! Did you say he scored thirty six goals in all comps in the, in the total? Yeah, so eighteen yeah. in the league, but he he scored in every round of the UEFA Cup, which Ipswich went on to win. So yeah. that's pretty impressive. And Very scoring impressive. scoring eighteen goals outside the league. I mean, you must have been smashing in the FA Cup, and then because I think they got. <laughs> I'm right in saying they got to the semis as well at the FA Cup. And when you look at the the match day programme, because I always dig it out, um, they were still going in all competition. So they were in, you know, top of the league at that time. They, with Villa just behind them, they were going to the FA Cup semi-final and they're about to have the UEFA Cup quarter-final with St Etienne. So, you know, juggling all these balls, Bobby Robson, what, what a manager. Let's face it, he... I think of all the managers, English managers, I can't think of a better manager. I mean, Alf Ramsey obviously preceded the Ipswich and went on to win the World Cup. But I I do feel within the world of football, Bobby Robson has the greater respect because Alf Ramsey was a bit... I mean, when things weren't going well, he wasn't a particularly nice guy and he turned on people quite quickly. But Bobby Robson had this... I feel he's the patrician of English football because everyone loved him. Even when he's not at your club, you loved Bobby Robson and obviously went on to Newcastle and England. But, uh, I mean, as a six-year-old, you're not going to really know who the guy in the dugout is. But did you develop that relationship in terms of the love of Bobby Robson? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, he's one, such a warm character, uh, mm. Bobby Robson. Just, just so likable. And yeah, like yeah, at the time I wouldn't have been aware of him, but obviously, as t- you know, as success came, you sort of respect him. And then, of course, he went and managed England, and 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 was a brilliant manager for England. He took a lot of stick; it wasn't all all yeah, glory, yeah. but but he always he was just such a great character. Um, and luckily enough, I, I kind of didn't get to know him. My parents probably got to know him better than me, but right. um, later on down the line. I went for the trials for the FA National School at Lillesham, oh, yeah. which was the sort of six, 16 best players in England at that time, according yeah. to the FA, got picked to, to, for this residential school in Lillesham, mm-hmm. where you go to a normal school for the last two years, year 10 and 11, and you'd play football every day and train. It was like an academy these days, basically, but yeah. for but for England. And, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, through those trials... Um, I think because I was a Suffolk boy, he, maybe he, he <laughs> took a, it took an extra shine to me. But um, yeah, I did well, and I, and I got selected. And I kind of had an inkling I might get selected because on the they had a meal um, for the parents uh, oh. of the last sort of thirty two or something like that, or when they narrowed it down to twenty four. I'm not quite sure what it was, yeah. but yeah, mum, mum and dad were, were placed next to Sir Bobby Robson on the table, so I thought, oh, oh wow. this is quite a nice <laughs> sign. So, um, so they enjoyed that evening. They said he was a wonderful, um, uh, you know, g- g- conversations were brilliant, and he was he was a superb character, and and yeah, he um, he said at the time that I'd reminded him of. Um, of Chris Waddle, which was a massive oh, compliment for me because nice. I loved I loved Chris Waddle as a player, even though he played for Spurs um, at the time. So yeah, so so we and then I got in, but I ended up not going as it happens because Arsenal weren't weren't too keen on the idea of me going, and mm. and they sort of put me off a little bit. So so I didn't didn't I t- chose to sort of reject that in the end. But um, but yeah, so it was it was a pleasure to sort of make his acquaintance briefly at that at that time. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was a golden era for, for Ipswich mm. Town. He did so much for the club. Um, going back to that first game, by the way, I should mention... Yeah, yeah. No, we, the, the, we always go off on a bit of yeah. a tangent, but we need to come back. You're right. No, j- just the one standout memory, because I can't remember the goals. You know, it's so long ago. I can't remember how they were scored. I do remember Andy Gray 
scoring mm -hmm. for Wolves, the famous yeah. commentator, you'll all know him, um, yeah. from Keys and Grey. Um, yeah, it snowed at half time, an absolute torrent of snow wow. uh, sort of fell out of the sky yeah. in buckets. And yeah. just before half time, it was, and it was all sort of landing on the players' heads, and the pitch was yeah. getting getting quite bad at the end, towards the end of the first half. And then during half time, it, 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 during that fifteen minutes, it covered the pitch, so they had to come out really? with, the, with the old shovels, the and shovels, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, and sort of make make the lines clear. Um, I'm, I'm guessing they might have had to have used the old classic orange ball as well, actually. I'm, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I haven't seen any old footage of it. I don't think it's on YouTube. But, um, but yeah, and then there's the second half war and it stopped snowing and, and, and the pitch cleared. But, yeah, that's a that's a real standout memory. And it's something that, yeah, for your first game, it's not offer. I don't, I don't know how many matches I've been to since. And I've been to yeah. a lot of matches yeah, where the yeah. pitch has been covered. I, I, I'm guessing like once or twice, you know, it's so it's quite a rare, rare occurrence. Exactly. And as you say, that's a really great memory to have because as a six-year-old, go, oh, well, it's covered in stuff. I think <laughs> nowadays the undersoil heating might kick in and, you know, the pristine <laughs> green carpets would not have any element of snow on them. <laughs> so in that game, John Walk scored, obviously, because he's, yeah. he's the top scorer. And you say Andy Gray, Wolves legend, Villa legend, um, scored for... Wolves, but the other two goals were from for Ipswich, were from Eric Gates, another player I remember really well, quite quite small and wiry, but you know, he bustled about a bit. And then Kevin Beattie, who mm. for me is one of those players that because I'm naturally really I'm a defender. Um I did play midfield when I was a bit younger, got far too tired doing that. So <laughs> I love defenders and Kevin Beatty for me was one of those defenders. I went, that looks like quite good fun. I quite like that. <laughs> do, you, do you remember him particularly well? Not so much because I think no. that he, he was coming towards the end of his time at Ipswich, I think, yeah. Kevin Beatty. And, and so I got to know the other players as they sort of stayed with the club for, for longer periods. Um, I th who would have taken over from him at left back? Wouldn't have been George Burley, but it was um I can't remember who 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 would have taken over his spot. Mm. But I remember him as being a bulldozing sort of fullback, yeah. wasn't he? He was really, really strong. Um yeah, he scored that day. The the in, inside him would have been the partnership of Russ Losman and, and Terry Butcher, which was an is an iconic yeah. uh, partnership with, with Mick Mills on, on the right. So and I and I during the course of my sort of media work, I sometimes do see Mick Mills because he still does a lot of work oh, right. for, okay. around Ipswich Town. He's, I think he does the local radio still for mm -hmm. them. So, um, so yeah, that's, that was a great, that was a great defence. But no, Kevin Beattie was one that I sort of, you, you will probably remember more than me. The one yeah. omission from the team that day, who I got to know, as well as Franz Tyson, who was the other Dutch, yeah. brilliant Dutch yeah, player. He didn't play that day. Yeah. Um, the other one was, it was Alan Brazil. Um, yeah. And uh, of course of talk sport fame and, like, you know, I've done a lot of work at TalkSport and I used to go in twice a week on Alan Brazil's breakfast show. Right. And I did dig, I dug out one of my old junior blues photos and it was a film. <laughs> I, I got him to sign it because he hadn't signed it at the time. So um, <laughs> so I thought, yeah, and it's never too late. And then, but he remembered the game as well. And he said, yeah, I wasn't playing that day, but I do remember the snow. And he said, I remember it. Yeah, you know, sort of landing on the players' heads and whatever. And yeah, it's, it's funny how... You know, players sort of it just little things jog their jog their memory, and yeah. So he he remembered it. I had a sort of little mini conversation with him about that first game. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know why he wasn't playing. I'm guessing I'm guessing he was injured. But but of course, back then, one sub, I think yeah. maybe two. One yeah, sub, one sub. Yeah, 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 one sub. So it was you know, if, if you're out of the team, it was quite hard to to get game time. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you ever picked up the program from the game. My dad's got it still. Yeah, he still he, he keeps. Well, my dad is an avid news. program collector. <laughs> I got Go it. And, oh, and I'm wow. going to send it. I'm going to send it to you because your dad wants to keep his copy. This no is way. your copy. Oh, that's and, so uh, kind of you. Yeah. On the back, again, yeah. you won't see this if you're listening to it. Alan Brazil is actually included as a number ten. So oh. maybe it was a late. In, I mean, obviously these were printed about six weeks yeah. before. Oh, the that's program, amazing. The actual yeah. match. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. That's right. yeah. And on the front, yeah. we've got. Do you recognise that Epswich player? Um, 
Is that Callahan? A Callahan? Yes, Kevin yeah, O'Callaghan. Yeah. Kevin yeah. O'Callaghan. Yeah, and yeah. He's, he's there with Viv Anderson. That's uh, it, Viv Anderson. Forest. What a legend! And I think his son or grandson played this. It must have been his grandson played this week um, for one of the sides in the Carabao Cup and and, and scored oh, a goal. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was quite that was quite funny. The um, yeah, Cal- Kevin O'Callaghan and a lot of this Ipswich team. For anyone that doesn't know much about Ipswich, you'll know this anyway, Richard. But the film Escape to Victory. Um, mm-hmm. absolute classic film featuring Pele yes. <laughs> amongst um, others amongst others yeah and um, a load of the extras the football football side extras of, of this team the prisoner of war team yeah. were Ipswich town players of that time. John Walt was in it wasn't he yeah Johnny Walt was in it Kevin O'Callaghan oh, was okay. in it uh, I'm just trying to think who else from the I think the goalie Paul Cooper was in it okay. um not too sure of how many others from that from that day, but there, there was a handful of it. Of right. it. Maybe Steve McCall. I think he might have been in it as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, check, check it out. If, well, I'm sure lots of people have seen it. But yeah, if you ever watch it back again, um, yeah, try and try and look out for the Ipswich players. Brilliant. No, we we love a bit of uh, Escape to Victory. It's one of those ones you can go back to and go, yeah. oh, here we go again. <laughs> you know, anything with Pele. John Walk and Kevin O'Callaghan's got to be a, a star. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'd love to have been on the red carpet for that one. Um, so, yeah, this game, Portman Road, 24,000. Do you remember the thrill of going? I mean, I love Portman Road, and, mm. and I'm, we will go on to talk about it. Mm. Fantastic to see it switch back in the Premier League. Because mm. for me, when I grew up, they were, you know, one of the, the top sides. I mean, this season particularly, mm. but generally they were in the first division. They were pretty mm. good. Always loved watching games at Portman Road. I've, I've been to Portman Road a couple of times to follow my own team, Palace, mm. and I've always loved that ground. There mm. is something about it, and it hasn't changed that dramatically since the day you went back in 1981. It hasn't. It really hasn't. And, um, yeah, um, the Cobbold stand was where we sat in the lower tier, mm. Just uh, the away fans would have been away to our left, or or maybe not back then. I think the away fans were probably housed somewhere else. But these days, yeah. if you if you imagine, it's it's the stand where the away fans go. They're in the upper yes. tier normally. That's right. We were in the lower tier, just along a bit closer towards the halfway line, just in front of some executive boxes, um, which are still there. Um, right. And uh, they were kind of early executive boxes at Ipswich. You know, they weren't. You know, not many clubs had them at that at that time. And it's funny, Ipswich tried to sign me when I was 14. Maybe this was to do with some Bobby oh, Robson, I don't know. Okay. I don't think it was because he'd, he'd long since moved on to the FA. But, um, yeah, they tried to sign me, obviously, because I played for Suffolk and they knew they knew that I was at Arsenal. But they were yeah. trying to woo me at, at 14. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, I remember sitting, it, you know, they treated us to a game in the director's box one week and then in the executive box another. It was, it was, it was really nice. And it was probably an executive box just behind... Where, where we sat but yeah the, the stand l- literally looks exactly the same now uh, it's mm. probably just some new seats in there and um yeah yeah it's nice it's nice because the the, the tv cameras will face that so when you yeah. watch Ipswich against you know the, the Ipswich Liverpool game or other games on tv it's the stand that's facing you that's that's mm. where we sat in the lower tier so um yeah yeah good times and uh, I was tempted to, to you know for a short period to maybe make the switch, but I really wanted to stay with Arsenal. And um, yeah, and yeah. Once they once they confirmed that they they wanted me, then it was it was a relatively easy easy call. But but yeah, it was hard to say no to it switch because that was the team I'd, I'd supported straight off the bat. Yeah, exactly. So when you how old were you when you actually signed as a schoolboy at Arsenal? Um, so they spotted me when I was ten, um, nearly oh. eleven, and then. So I went to the Centre of Excellence there for a few years and and then so that would have been yeah, I mean what would that have been eighty five, eighty six. Yeah. Um and then and then yeah, stayed with Arsenal all the way through basically and until mm-hmm. I left in nineteen ninety seven. So yeah, I probably spent eleven, twelve years at Arsenal, even though it's sort of as a full time player, yeah. six years, but uh, two as an, an apprentice, four as a professional. Um but yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Prior, prior to that so um yeah long long association with with arsenal um but yeah at 14 there was you you, you used to sign contracts at 14 called schoolboy forms which mm-hmm. effectively tied you to the club if they wanted to keep you you kind of couldn't get away so it was yeah. a really big big decision to make at 14 and that's when other teams not just for me but for all all sort of players 
that that were coveted they the clubs were circling <laughs> and yeah. you know so we had had the Ipswich Town manager at the time um uh, who was the manager at the time Fer- I can't remember was it Bobby Ferguson the Ipswich Probably, Town yeah. manager was um was um you know had a chat with us tried to persuade us West Ham were, were also trying to 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 get me to go there John Lyle was the manager there who ended oh, yes. up going yeah, to Ipswich yeah. um mm-hmm. and he yeah, he was he was very charismatic and uh yeah, it, it, it could sell West Ham. <laughs> um, <laughs> um but yeah, in the end in the end I start with Arsenal. Well, there we go. I mean it's, it's <laughs> fair enough. I mean it, it's interesting as you say because you grew up an Ipswich fan so did you did you go fairly regularly after that first game or was it sort of interspersed with other stuff. Yeah, so when I got old enough, I'd, I'd get the, like a bus from Haverhill to, to, to Ipswich, you know, as a teenager yeah. with, a, with a mate or two. So yeah, we'd go to games. It was easier to get tickets then, you know, the games weren't sold out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would do that, even though I was sort of still playing, playing for Arsenal at the time. So yeah, it was a fun thing to do as a teenager. Um, but of course, at this time, I'd already been with Arsenal at that time and used to get tickets um Com, right. com, comps as we used to call them um, yeah, yeah. so I'd been watching Arsenal probably from the age of 11 you know as often as I possibly could so I saw some great Arsenal teams cool. you know I saw the 89 season the 1991 both title winning seasons mm-hmm. before I joined full time as a player so so my allegiances I, I shamefully my allegiances did were diverted to <laughs> Arsenal <laughs> so yeah. I ended up becoming an Arsenal supporter and Ipswich sort of it coincided with them falling away, you know, yeah. post to Bobby Robson. They they weren't yeah. as strong a team, and uh, yeah. and so they were they they became my my second team, I guess, or you know, the, right. the my other team. So and that's kind of how it stayed till today, really. Well, I think it's interesting when you talk to players, ex players, about the fact that they could have, and that they often say, "Well, I supported X as a you know as a kid," but then suddenly you get signed by another team then then you're going to switch particularly when you're young you you're going to switch your allegiance i generally i don't agree with people having second clubs though whatever no. but i'm allowing you this agent you're allowed to do this <laughs> i mean i had chris sutton on here and he he grew up uh, in norfolk so he was born in nottingham but his yeah. his parents moved to norfolk quite early and then he got picked up by norwich yeah and then obviously he is an Norwich fan he's been you know, to Blackburn, to Chelsea, to Celtic, um, mm. but Norwich is still that that one in yeah. his heart. So he doesn't have the issue of <laughs> being signed as a young lad and then having oh, who should I support? So well, I'm most sure of the time, most of my it. life since since you know since the Suburban Rovers days, not all of it, a lot of it, it's just been in the second tier, you know. Well, so exactly, so even the third tier. Yeah, right? exactly. Well, so I've been a, a, afforded that chance to sort of um, yeah have another team, but yeah, it's in essence, I think it's wrong. But yeah, for me, <laughs> I, it's a funny one with Arsenal. I think a lot with a lot of players that join Arsenal, not all, but mm. with a lot. It does get into you. It's a, it's a sort of club yeah. that really you, you 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 it gets into your blood somehow. I don't know how it is. Sort of once a gooner, always a gooner. It's a it's a it's a funny one, really. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely number one now. But but I I'm loving the fact that Ipswich are back in the Premier oh, yeah. League. It's yeah. awesome. And they've got Liverpool coming up this weekend, which will be an interesting introduction to the world of the Premier League. And <laughs> I have to say, McKenna has done a fantastic job. And I'm very glad he stayed because yeah. there was, you know, when he got the double promotion, there was quite a lot of interest in him. So yeah. good yeah. old Kieran. New contract. And, and look, Ipswich Town fans of, of a certain age are united in their view that, that Kieran McKenna is the is the best coach they've seen at Portman Road since Sir Bobby Robson. So, oh, well, okay. you know, so yeah. he, he is... He isn't honestly. He's in in their eyes. He is the second coming uh, of him. So so let's hope. You know, yeah. it's going to be a lot more difficult for it yeah. to get the kind of success that that he did. But but he is really really respected, and and I get it. He's he's performed miracles there. Absolutely right. Um, one thing I always like to ask people is the kit, mm. because that again is something you can take in. Um, Generally, it's, it's really been really interesting because clearly a lot of these games that I've been talking to people about are quite a way in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I even had Alan Smith, the ex-Palace manager. His first game was 1956. <laughs> okay. Fulham, Newcastle. Yeah. And funnily enough, Bobby Robson was playing oh, for Fulham that day, yeah, yeah, yeah. as yeah. well as Jimmy Hill. Yeah. Um, so, we've got Ipswich. Again, it's interesting because the kit hasn't really changed that much. You've got the blue and white. It was Adidas mm. kit. It had the mm. stripes down the sleeves and also down the short. I love that kit. Blue it's and white, simple beautiful. bang. And beautiful. Were you yeah. immediately struck? And also wolves, quite frankly, gold and black. It's got to be up there as one of the best kits. And, and yeah. they stuck with it as well. Yeah, they're iconic, aren't they? Yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, and the fact that it was Adidas, you know, Adidas probably, <laughs> I love Adidas kits. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, the three stripes, obviously it's the classic with the with the uh, trefoil badge, which yeah. is coming back into vogue now, of course. Yeah, it, the thing that I've always loved about Ipswich, and I've had this conversation on radio before when right. I've been hosting, and you know, when you're thinking of just random stuff to chat about and yeah. talking about club badges, you know, who's got a best club badge? And for me, Ipswich Town have absolutely got one of the best badges mm. um, in, of the 92. I, I just think it's iconic with the, you know, with the horse there. Yeah. And it just hasn't, it hasn't changed. A lot of clubs have rebranded, obviously, down the years. Arsenal have, mm. um, most have. But Ipswich is, is still pretty much as it was when I saw them that day back in 81. Yeah, I love, uh, yeah, I love the kit. My favourite Ipswich kit came a yeah. few years later in, I think it was 84, it was modelled on the France um, kit. Yes. So you the had red, the yeah. red stripe, across, red hoop yes. across yes. the front. Um, yeah. I think the sponsor would have even been Pioneer. It might have been Pioneer. And then it went to Fison's, but I think it was Pioneer. And, it, and underneath the red the red hoop, you had three thin white, stri- white, white hoops yes. coming across the jersey. That was a beauty of a kit. Um, yeah. yeah, I kind of want one. You need to get one, surely. Yeah, I know. With your yeah. connection, surely they should be flooding it. Actually, it's, it's, it's interesting because this kit was the last kit without a sponsor. Okay, yeah. Then, as you, you quite rightly pointed out, Pioneer with the first shirt sponsor for it, which mm. I think a year or two later, and then, as you say, it went on to others. And yeah. Clearly, there have been huge amounts of sponsors for most of these teams. So that's something that, is always impressed in people. <laughs> Did you actually get, you know, the this game or soon after you get a scarf? Did you get any yeah. memorabilia? Was scarf. that something that you were into? <laughs> yeah, scarf and a bobble hat. Obviously, I needed oh, a course. bobble hat. It was freezing well, cold. It was rainy. It was, sorry, <laughs> snowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the blue and white blue and white bobble hat and, and a blue and white scarf. Yeah, so, yeah, I, okay. I, I spoke to my mum and dad before, before I, you know, I spoke to you just to see if they could, you know, jog some memories. And, and yeah, mm-hmm. they... I asked them that same question. Did I get a scarf and a hat? And they said, yep. Okay, <laughs> so, good. yeah, my little brother was left at home. He'd have been three at the time. They, they'd have got yeah. him. He'd have stayed with my grandparents. And, and yeah, I got the sort of treat of my first first match. And I think six is a good age to go because mm. you can just about remember it, can't you, yeah. as you grow older. Anything younger, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stretch. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I do remember... The, the, you know, walking in and, you know, it's just see, seeing all the people. It, it, is a, it is a real treat. And when I took my own youngest children to mm-hmm. to um, their first game, uh would have been the season before last. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was the season before last, Arsenal against Leeds. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, did, I wanted them to, to leave it as late as possible to go out into the into the stadium to yeah. so that their first impression of it was was packed you know yes. so uh, yeah. cause it can just yeah. blow your blow your mind i think as a young yeah. person so yeah i think and if you turn up at two o'clock for the three o'clock kickoff it might be a little bit underwhelming because generally it's different isn't it yeah stadiums don't they suddenly you know 10 minutes ago you think oh this is a bit low this crowd then suddenly whoosh yeah everyone yeah. fills it i suppose they've got i think what i would yeah that. The best way to any advice to any you parents that haven't taken their kids to their first game yet is take them in, see your seat, let them get get their surroundings, then take them out, you know, yes, to have a drink or whatnot, and, and yeah, then yeah. leave it until just before the players come out, and then go back up the steps into That's into your good. seats, and then you. I just think it's a boom moment, isn't it? It's like whoa, oh, what yeah. is going on here? <laughs> um, and and I just think that kids never forget that, you know. It's that amazing. Is- it's true, and, and so many people in this podcast have said the same thing. It's that walking up and going, "Oh my goodness!" And 
you know, we all go on about the green grass. In the old days, actually, funny enough, it wasn't that green. It was <laughs> brown and there was an odd little strand on the side. And that this was is about true. it. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's, you know, a fantastic memory. And you say the snow, I think, is probably the most impressive thing about that mm -hmm. game, apart from a really good Ipswich side. Now, you say John Walk was your hero and you were developing, you know, six, but then you became a schoolboy footballer. Mm -hmm. Did you model yourself on John Walk or did you think, right, I, I could take some of the attributes? Is that something that happens when you become a pro footballer or yeah, is it? Not really. No, no. I, I think I just you just, you are the player that you are. You just said you were a natural yeah. defender. You know, you're, yeah, like, your favourite players might have been defenders, but, you know, a lot yeah. of defenders have a favourite players that are strikers, you know. it's um, No, I think it was more you just, I just played football. You know, my dad was a good good player. He played sort of semi-pro, good good amateur okay. level. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the highest he got was sort of late in Orient. I think he played for the second team at Orient. Okay. And he played in you know, various sort of town teams as he got mm -hmm. older. But, um, yeah, I sort of, I don't know, I just naturally became a sort of winger uh, quite early yeah. on. My left foot was was natural, and yeah, so that so I was sort of on the left of a left of the attack right from the get go, really, and then right. developed developed from there. I kind of stayed as a left winger, became uh, a left and right winger because I sort of worked hard on my on my right foot, so that it was mm. almost as good. And yeah, so I played on either wing or or at number ten, really, throughout my career. I ended up actually as a central midfielder um, mm. when I was when I was knocking on. In my thirties, but um, yeah. but yeah, no, um, my, my sort of the play, the one player I probably did um, model myself on a little bit was 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 Chris Waddle. Uh, yeah. He was a, a fantastic uh, talent, um, not 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 rapid, and I, and I probably I was quick, but I wasn't rapid. You know, I wasn't oh. Theo Walcott quick, no. and uh, I was more of a drop a shoulder kind of guy uh, or use quick feet, and and that was very much Chris Chris Waddle. Um, he liked to um, tease defenders, which I yeah. I like to do as well. Um, and and yeah, I, I I didn't specifically copy him, but um, yeah. but yeah, I think that's probably the closest that that I was to. And and then another player as I got a little bit older that I was always compared to, probably because my my hair was quite long at the time. But it was Steve <laughs> McManaman? I had, lo I had quite really? long curly hair and. Yeah, Steve McManaman was the one. Even in the paper, the local paper at South End, they kept saying it, and yeah, they were asking. I, can't, I remember I got asked once, I think from a journalist at the Sun, uh, randomly that, that happened to go into a South End game, probably in the third tier, and um, it, yeah, he was he was like, oh, you reminded me of Steve McManaman out there today, skipping down the wing, blah blah blah. And I said, like, oh, cheers, yeah. Oh, I've always loved, you know, I've always liked Steve McManaman, you know, someone that I look up to and blah, blah, blah. And of course, on the, the match report, you know, yeah. it was all I, McManaman, not 2.0, but, you know, McManaman yeah. wannabe, basically. Yeah. And I felt a little bit embarrassed afterwards because I basically yeah. said that, you know, I loved this guy and I was I was trying to copy him. So yeah, I, I, I was a bit more tight lipped in future interviews. Well, you learned your lesson there, didn't you? You know, don't talk to journalists <laughs> openly because yeah. guess what's going to happen? You know, although as journalists ourselves, that's a bit unfair because we and do I think want that, people to talk to us. Yeah, the worst thing about it, Rich, was that because he, he bigged me up, um, is as in why he wanted to speak to me, and I thought he's yeah. going to give me a good mark in the paper. I'll at least get an eight. And I think I think he gave me a six. A <laughs> that's not a Steve McManaman <laughs> mark, is it? It's not even a Chris Model mark. You know, it should be at least eight or nine. So we're talking about now. You moved on. You stayed at Arsenal for a long time. And then I want to touch on your professional debut. I know you don't want to necessarily touch on it too much, but right, yeah. it was in it was on New Year's Eve in mm. 1994. So you've been at the club for quite a while. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your memory of that game? Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, no, I'm delighted to talk about it. It's my debut for Arsenal. You know, it's yeah. what you'd worked for. And... Yeah, we uh, yeah it sort of came a little bit out of the blue. There's a bit of an injury crisis, and mm -hmm. and yeah, I was drafted into the squad, and yeah, I didn't know that I was going to be be uh, on the bench until the match day. So we, we used to sit at a golf club in Hertfordshire and have our pre-match meal, and yeah, he just mm -hmm. sort of named me on the bench, and yeah, then we made our way to to, to the ground, and it was um, yeah, it was a surreal experience, just absolutely fantastic. Loved it. 
Um, and I came on 15, 20 to go. And yeah, and it, it didn't go to plan. Well, I did OK, but with, with the ball, I did OK. You know, I came on for Alan Smith, which I thought was was lovely but in retrospect, yeah. because he, he was one of my sort of uh, the people I looked up to most when I finished playing because he'd mm-hmm. been one of the few footballers that became a proper journalist. Yes. You know, he he, yeah, he yeah. was a, he was a good writer for the Telegraph and whatnot, and, yeah. and obviously he's good had a great career. Yeah. yeah, very good broadcaster. So I've always looked up to Smudger. So I came on for him. Um, I went on to the left wing. Uh, Kevin Campbell, the late great Kevin Campbell, who we lost lost sadly this year. Was he moved, was yesterday. Wasn't uh, I, yeah, I think it was two yeah. two days ago. Yeah, um, yeah, it's such such sad news. Um, and he moved from the left wing to the striker, and look, I got some nice touches of the ball and clipped some balls into Kev Campbell and and, and played okay. But but they did score QPR two late goals, kind yeah. of both down my side of the pitch. So I felt a little bit guilty. I don't think I was culpable particularly, but mm-hmm. but but you know, it was one of those one of those situations where you, you think, oh, no. We, you know, things got worse once I came on, but I was still buzzing. You know, it was still yeah. a great experience. And that night, you know, I was out. I was only 20, I think. And, you know, I had New Year's Eve plans. You know, I was um, of yeah, that yeah. age. I think I went up the local pub and I, I just felt a million dollars, you know, I just, yeah. just made my arse for debut. So that was, yeah, it was awesome. But yeah, you, it's one of those where you sort of wish that the, the result had gone a little bit better. Yeah, because you ended up losing three one that hybrid to yeah. QPR. Yeah, so it was Kevin, one apiece, and then yeah, Kevin yeah. Gallon had scored very early on, as he often did. And then mm-hmm. the fact is that you were there on the bench at the time because you hadn't quite come on for John Jensen's one and only goal for Arsenal. Let's face it, was it ninety odd appearances, one goal, but it was a pretty good goal. Do you remember? It's a fantastic it? goal. Yeah, it was a yeah. curler. Uh, yeah, John Jensen uh, w- was a cult hero. I also signed him on the back of him scoring the winner for Denmark at Euro 92. Yeah. And he, in truth, he wasn't a brilliant player. Like he was a good tigerish <laughs> midfielder, but yeah. as an attacking force, he, he didn't have that much in his locker. Uh, <laughs> he was quite limited, really. Um, yeah. And, you know, the lads used to rib him about, you know, how bad his shooting was and everything. And, mm-hmm. But the fans cottoned on that this guy would have loads of shots and never come close to scoring. And then... And then yeah. lo and behold, it became a thing. It did. Everyone would always say, shoo, you know, when, when he yeah. had the ball. And uh, yeah, then this on this day, he, he cuts inside into his right. He's he's 22 yards out and just curls a beauty into the far top corner. The, the hybrid went berserk. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I think I was actually warming up at the time. Um, mm. And and yeah, we were all loving it. It was it was a great memory. Uh, and and in the, in the weeks that followed, um, the stall holders, outside Highbury and um, made the t-shirts. Of course, I was there when John Jensen scored. <laughs> and I, I hope you've one. got one. I bought um, one. Did got you to sign it? And I still yeah. got it. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah. So That's a good uh, bit of football memorabilia, I must say. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't mind. I like a bit of football memorabilia. So, yeah. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And am I right in thinking, was George Graham still manager at that point? He was. Yeah. George, George, George was the manager. Yeah. Um, he'd been the manager since I, had been there as a 10, 11 year old. So right. yeah, I, I still had that feeling. He's one of those where I always got the feeling he never actually knew your name, you know, even yes. though he obviously did, but yeah, yeah. It, it was such a sort of an aloof character, you know, a, a good bloke and a, and a great manager, obviously, but never, he always kept that arm's length distance from, from players. And mm. uh, yeah, I swear that he, he, I don't know if he used to do it on purpose just to keep my feet on the ground, but you know, he'd, he'd call me Andrew, I'm sure loads of times and, and Andy, you know, instead of AD, I, it, yeah. just, it used to get to me. And I, I don't know whether that was psychology or whether he was just a little bit bad with names. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'd never make a school teacher, would he, George Graham? Let's face it. Um, there's actually another person I've had on this pod who you all know, Stuart Robson. So he was a little bit earlier than you. Mm. And when George Graham arrived, George Graham was not very keen on Stuart Robson cutting from the team. And in the end, Stuart left for West Ham, actually. But, uh, yeah, George Graham, interesting character. Um, so, that was, at right. the time, Arsenal were mid-table, sort of 13th, QPR 14th. So, there was yeah. not a lot on this. Uh, and as you say, interestingly, the following, the, the return fixture, which was at QPR, again, they beat Arsenal 3-1, you weren't involved, but yeah. 
that was Seb Hutchinson's first game. Uh, okay, okay. So yeah, he, concept, he yeah. went to the to Loftus Road and saw the second three one win for QPR. But <laughs> importantly now, we're gonna mm. move to your actual first start for Arsenal. And coincidentally, guess who it was against? <laughs> Tell us, Adrian. Yeah, so it was a noon kickoff. Um this Boxing was Boxing Day. day. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. going for New Year's Eve to Boxing Day. I, cut, I sort of went back to the reserves the rest of that first season. Then the next yeah. year, um, Bruce Rioch was the manager. And um, he took a shine to me. He really, really liked my, my game. And I trained with the first team pretty much every day that season. Yeah. And I was knocking on the door. I think I'd come off the bench again at Southampton previously, mm-hmm. um, which, was, which was great. We had 10 men in that game. Right. And I think Tony Adams had been sent off. And it was a backs to the wall effort. And we held on for the nil-niller at the Dell. Um, yeah. So then, yeah, I'd been in the squad, almost came on at Anfield. Um, uh, and then, but I didn't. And then, yeah, Boxing Day, I, again, I didn't know until I got to the ground. So on the Christmas Day, I'd ate, I'd ate a fair bit. You know, I was thinking I might be sub, I might not be, yeah. you know, who knows. But I, I, I hadn't really sort of held back that much, you know. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, I turned up at the ground. It was a noon kickoff. So, you know, there at, I don't know, half 10. Yeah. And... Um, and yeah, there it was. Name on the wall. Name on the sheet. Everyone was like, wow. Clarky, have you seen the sheet? And I'm like, no, what? And then my heart skips a beat. And then it's like there. And there I was, um, number uh, number 29. Um, yeah. yeah, so tremendously exciting. And and I think it was better that way because I didn't have time to think about it. didn't have time yeah. to get nervous. It was just like a real buzz. And yeah, just, just a glorious moment. You know, I, they made a real fuss sort of on the head of, you know, when we were warming up, I sort of mm-hmm. was on the big screen. Um, I think, I don't know if I was with Gunnosaurus or something on the big screen. They, they were basically <laughs> sort of introducing me, you know, to making his yeah. debut today as Adrian. And then, and then the game went brilliantly. Yeah. It yeah. was, it was all, it was a sunny, a really crisp, cold day, bright blue sky, um, sunny. And yeah, just right from the get go, everything seemed to come off me. I was sort of, Skipping past um, the defenders, got some good early touches, and and yeah, I didn't score. I, did, I, I didn't make an assist, but it it, it couldn't have gone better, really. And yeah. and afterwards, um, the they pulled me up to um, Jonathan Pierce. It was um, oh, yeah. pulled me up from the sort of dressing room area to the press box uh, post match to to do a chat. It's for. I think it was for Capital Gold. Capital Gold, uh, that would be it. Gold. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they was, he was sort of saying, you know, we made you our man on a match today, blah, blah, blah. And and, and they, they sort of had a nice chat. And then on the way home, um, I was listening and, oh well, no, they went to the dressing room, had, um, I remember having a bar. I'll never forget this. And I've, I've reminded Martin of this because it was such a nice moment. Mm. So we won 3 0. I, I think, you know, I think I've played all right. And then my, I'm in the bath next to him. We had individual baths and, and, um, and, uh, he goes, Clark, he said, you have just torn apart one of the best right backs in England. Well done, son. Well done, son. Like that. And uh, and I, 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 it meant nothing to Martin. But to, yeah. to me, as a young player, it was like, whoa, OK. Yeah, yeah. that's that's because David Barsley was brilliant. He was a, mm. he's not he's not a household name, but he was he was your archetypal. Yeah. Seven out of ten every week. You know, he not solid many... full back, wasn't he? Yeah, he was wasn't solid. he he's not a modern full back because no. he was solid and he defended. Yes. Not play for Oxford as well, I think. Yeah, um... I, I can't remember, but he he, he was he was excellent and, mm. and it was just my day. Yeah, just managed to managed to, yeah. to, to do lots of good things and and yeah, and uh, yeah, on the way home, I remember that, um, David Platt was on the radio five live or radio two as it might have been then. Yeah. And, he was. They were asking him about me, you know, the debutant today, wow. Adrian Clark, and and then he's yeah. like, he's sort of praising me up, and it was like, wow, this is amazing. It just, yeah. it was just a glorious day, and it was. It, in truth, it didn't get any better than that. You know, I probably didn't play quite as as well as that again mm. in any of the first team appearances. Not not over the course of a full ninety, anyway. Yeah. So that was yeah. sort of like the the the, the, the echelon, the, the the peak of of my career, I guess. Uh, it's a shame yeah. it happened when I was twenty twenty one, but. You know that you know that these things happen. So there's a lesson there for young professional footballers: 
eat a massive amount the day <laughs> before you make your professional debut and exactly. it'll all fall into play. Because <laughs> actually in the game, you know, you beat QPR 3-0, um, chap called Ian Wright scored very late in the first <laughs> Heard of half. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Paul Merson scored a couple in, in the second half. Yeah. When you actually look through the lineups, it's, you know, all these people giving you praise. So Martin Keown saying, you, you made it. Demi Black telling the radio, this is the guy, mm-hmm. man of the match. Mm. Every single other player was an international. Yeah. Seaman, <laughs> Dixon, Winterburn, Adams, Keown, Platt, Merson, Jensen, Clark, Dickoff, Wright. Yeah. Every yeah, single that, one. So yeah, you, you yeah. know, you'd reached the peak there, as you said. Yeah, it was yeah, it was yeah, it was a privilege to play with those guys, honestly. It was yeah, it was amazing. Ian Wright was fantastic, you know, he was he was very welcoming. They all were. Um, but yeah, Ian Wright was always really good with me, you know, sort of joking around, making me feel part of it. Um, probably Dickoff would have been in for for Dennis Burkham. Um, De- you know, Dennis was there at the time, so lucky enough to play with him a few times. Um, but Dicky was a great, he's a great player, he's a real tigerish, um, sort of yeah. fiery Scott. Um, you know, he had an excellent career, but yeah, Burkham is the name that you can sort of add to that, um, that team. In some of the games I played, and, and of course Parlour as well. I probably played instead of Parlour maybe that that day, um, or Glenn Helder. I would have come in for Glenn Helder, yes, I think that day. I um, so so yeah, it was it was amazing. And I stuck around the first team for the next three or four months. Played played a few games, was in and out. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, and, and and had some really good good flashes, some good moments. Um, but, but yeah, probably that QPR game was my best 90 minute performance. Um, mm. I, you know, in the other ones, I, I held my own, did some good things. Um, but ultimately, I guess I probably didn't do enough to stay there, you know, because there's so many great players that that, that won that shirt, aren't there? So, yeah, it's a tough place to, to stay for long periods because the standards are, you know, the standards at that time were growing quite quickly, actually. Exactly. And, you know, you... It must be interesting for you because you must bump into some of these players on a fairly regular basis because yeah. you're now in the media. So Lee Dixon, Martin yeah. Keown, Paul Merson, Ian Wright. You know, these are people you're... I'm sure you keep rem- reminding them, do you remember that game against QPR when <laughs> no, I, no, I absolutely no. ripped David Barnes? No, 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 no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. No, but they're all really <laughs> friendly. But it's, isn't yeah. it amazing how many Arsenal uh, players from that team have gone exactly. into the media? I mean, yeah. Seaman has become a media personality. Uh, Dixon, true, yeah. Dixon is, is, you know, he's a, you know, he's at the top of the tree in terms of co coms. Um, yeah, Adams, we know about Keown. Winterburn does still does work for Arsenal oh, TV. Right, he's, a okay. good, he's a good pundit. Merce, we know, is years yeah. at Sky. You know, Alan Smith, we talked about earlier. Course, um, yeah. Parler's been on the radio for Donkey's years. Yeah. Uh, Ian Wright is, you know, a, a national treasure. It's exactly. it's remarkable. I don't know what it was about that Arsenal dressing room. I think one thing it, it does tell you about that Arsenal dressing room is that there was a, a genuine love of the game. For, from from all the players mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you don't go into the media um as a pundit or or whatnot unless you really love football um and and I think that uh, and that you want to understand football and and even continue to learn about football and and that must have been the case with that with that mm-hmm. Arsenal team that's why those players were were so successful I guess because they genuinely had you know they loved it they didn't want to move outside of the game once, yeah. once they retired, which, you know, if you look at other teams, you know, Spurs players or Chelsea, you know, a lot of these other teams, it, Arsenal heavily outweigh. I'd say Arsenal and Liverpool probably yeah, heavily outweigh everybody else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's maybe it's to do with, in part, you know, George Graham, Arsene Wenger, yeah. that the, the, these players didn't want to let go. And um, yeah. and also, I think the other thing to point out is, and p- some people might scoff at this because I don't want to say that, that we're all brains of Britain, but you also need to be quite smart to yeah. have a lengthy career in, in broadcasting in, in, yeah, in the media. Because, yeah. you know, you've got to think on your feet. You've got to analyse properly. Otherwise, you won't last. Um, mm-hmm. So there was also that game intelligence. And, and that maybe that, I'm, I'm sure a lot of that did come from, from George Graham, who was meticulous. <laughs> Let yeah. me tell you, in his preparation uh, for yes. matches, um, and I think the players learnt a lot from him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, 
it's interesting you say that meticulous thing with George Graham. I, I would imagine, you know, we talk now about Pep Guardiola being absolutely drilled into every single detail and he wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and phones the coach to go, I think what we should do next time <laughs> is this. And he wakes three o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> that's a parallel with those days. I mean, as you say, Bruce Riott was the manager when, um, you know, who took a shine to you. Interestingly, I... I, this week's podcast features a guy called D- Daniel Gray. I don't even know. He's a, he's a writer. He writes some great books about football. I, I would urge anyone to do it. It's mm-hmm. one called 3 p.m. Saturday, 50 short chapters about the beauty of football. And it is class. Mm-hmm. And he's a great guy. He's a Middlesbrough fan. So Bruce Rioch was the manager for his first match mm-hmm. at Middlesbrough. <laughs> and he, he points this out in the programme notes. Bruce Rioch, whose dad was a sergeant major, I believe, in the army, yeah, yeah. talks about drugs in football. And he actually mentions the fact that, you know, these are different drugs. They're not cocaine or marijuana or LSD. In the programme notes, can you imagine? <laughs> nowadays, you go, Whoa, don't do that. Don't raise that issue. But, um, and this was the last season before Wenger arrived. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, he only lasted a season. Um, you know, we improved. We got up to sort of fifth, I think. Uh, in you were, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't a bad season at all. You know, we should have been with the players that we had. It's the least Ooh. us should have been. Um, but but they'd they'd been. I think the players had started to switch off a little bit to George Graham in the the, yeah. the year or two previous, and that's why there was a downturn and become more of a cup team. Um, I just think it was a voice you know, the same voice to, for too long, really. Um, yeah. And that they just, they needed something fresh. Bruce Rowe came in. I liked him. Um, he, he, a lot, some of the players did, but some didn't. And, and you know, that Sergeant Major sort of style yeah. um, did, did rub rub some people up the wrong way. And and, sure. and then they made the change um, with Arsene Wenger coming in, which is amazing. And yeah, unfortunately, I never got to play in the first team under Wenger. I trained mm-hmm. with the first team quite a bit uh, in the early weeks. Um and then, yeah, yeah, to cut a long story short, there was a fire at the training ground. It burnt the change rooms down. Right. And then we suddenly had sort of a separate groups. So uh, the first team group was would, would would change at Sopwell House and bus in. And then mm-hmm. everybody else would get changed to sort of port cabins at, okay. at the training ground. And, and, yeah, he wanted a smaller group to do that. And I sort of didn't quite make the cut. And then, yeah, you sort of then become a little bit isolated from from the first team and yeah. and that's what it was so I ended up I needed to go out on loan and, and that's what I did yeah so if if people don't know about Adrian's career so he moved from Arsenal you went to Rotherham I think on loan and then you went to South End on loan and I think you then signed permanently for South End yeah. um so I believe your first goal professional goal mm. Was for South End? Do, do you remember was, that? Yeah, yeah yes, <laughs> I absolutely do. do. Yeah. Uh, well, it's probably thirty yards that... curling in the left hand well, side. Well, you, you you jest, but that kind of was <laughs> it. Really? It wasn't really? thirty yards, but yeah, no, th- I put it up on my Instagram. So if anyone wants to have a look, Adrian. Okay, J. Clark. I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. yeah, Adrian J Clark, I think it's on Instagram. I, I put it up ahead of Arsenal Brentford l- last year, so you won't have to scroll too far down because I don't do that no. many updates. Um, I, I jokingly put, this is how you score against Brentford. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it was a, you see it for yourself, but it was a nice okay. goal. Cause, um, yeah, I got the ball sort of right side of the box and I sort of did a uh, drop to shoulder and and, mm. the, and the defender dived in and, and sort of ended up on the deck, which always looks better. Nice. And then I curled it in left-footed from the, from the right side of the box into the far top corner. So it was... It was a it was a lovely goal and uh, yeah. yeah it was one I absolutely never forget. It was it was the first match I believe played after the death of, of Princess Diana, so that's okay. something that sort of sticks in my mind. I think we had a two minute applause before the game, as everything had stopped at that time, yeah. and um, yeah, so we resumed and 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 yeah, it just couldn't have gone better. And yeah, once you score your first goal, once you make that first big contribution, I think you do start to feel a lot more at home. And mm. um, yeah, I enjoyed my time at Southend. We didn't have a great, we didn't have a great team. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we scored lots, but we let in lots. And that, and that was, that was the issue really. But, um, but yeah, I had, I had a lovely time there. And that, and that, that night was, it was, yeah, it was one of the, one of the better nights I had, had for the club. 
And that was at Roots Hall, was it? Was it was at Roots Hall, yeah. Um, lo lovely old ground. I mean, it hasn't. Oh, I mean, I, I say I lovely there as well. Um, yeah, I say lovely. It's, it's not lovely. Quite creepy. It's, it's 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 falling apart. Um, it doesn't really look any different to when I played there. Um, no. You know, I, I really hope South End can get themselves out of the pickle that they're in at the moment. They should be back in the EFL. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, it was it, yeah it was it was a peach of a goal. I sort of I did my celebration, which was sort of copying my dad, just sort of like a one one nice. finger up celebration. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's just something you you never ever forget. I think we beat Brentford that night, which was three one. I believe. Nice. Yeah, 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 three one. So um, yeah, happy days. <laughs> nice. And so you, you know, you you as I said in the introduction, you've played at every level. So you played at the Premier League mm. with Arsenal. I think Championship with Rotherham. And South, then End, South, no, South End, End was championship. Oh, South End. Championship. On loan, yeah. Yeah, they, okay, they yeah. were rock bottom of the championship when I went right. there. They were pretty much down. But I went there from Easter onwards and and, and played quite well and enjoyed it. And and Ronnie Whelan asked me, to, you know, they wanted me to stay. And then Ronnie Whelan resigned. Um, wow. uh, you know, I don't know if there's a disagreement with the chairman or, or, or whatnot. But after I'd agreed to go there, he left. And then I was yeah. in this limbo position of, do I still sign or not? Um because obviously you don't know if the new manager is going to like you. So yeah. I did. I took a chance because I really enjoyed, you know, the dressing room. I thought it was a you know, good bunch of lads. Um, so yeah, I signed and Alvin Martin came in and it was fine. It was fine under Alvin Martin. He, he played me most weeks. Right. Two big names, really. Ronnie Whelan and Alvin Martin. Yeah, yeah. Manager Ronnie was still the best player. Because <laughs> he, <was, laughs> he, he, he didn't... I'll tell you... It's another first. Obviously, my, my debut for, for South End was was actually mm. on loan at Tranmere in the in the Championship. It's quite a nice little story. I think we'd had one five aside training session the, the day before, and he'd been nutmegging everyone. You know, it was, there was no real prep for the game. And then, yeah, so we went to the game um, and come in from the warm up. The buzzer goes as as it does, or the bell, you know, to say right, you need to get in the tunnel. Yeah. And it was like. We hadn't talked really at all about set pieces. And I said, I said, oh, Ronnie, what's that? Because I'd been used to being at Arsenal where everything was a little yeah. bit more planned out. Yeah. And uh, I said, Ronnie, what? who's on set pieces? He's like, oh, I forgot, <laughs> damn it. Like that. And I was like, what? Really? And he goes, oh, uh, you have not you have not like that. And I said, well, I love what, what have you worked on? <laughs> I said, "What you in swingers, out swingers, near posts? You know what? What do you want? Just swing, just swing it in there, mate. Just swing it." In. Nice. <laughs> I mean, I love that. We, we lost three 0 It was no wonder, really. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, yeah, it was um, different times. Uh, Ronnie was a, he's a lovely guy, um, mm -hmm. and 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 in many respects of his management were, were excellent. He, he was a really good yeah. man manager, but yeah, in terms of attention to detail at that point it probably wasn't mm. wasn't up there the, the the idea of meticulous might not actually <laughs> ring true for ronnie Whelan, but as you say mm. there are different attributes and being a man manager is a really important part of being a manager as well as mm. the tactical side so rotherham south ed mm. was lead to stevenage was that was that because you were there for yeah. what a couple of years Do yeah you... so yeah carlisle uh i did a loan spot oh. at carlisle as well in league two um so yeah, what happened? I, I fell out of favour. Uh, under well, a new manager came in called yeah. Alan Little, and he actually sadly passed away recently. Oh, yeah. well, Alan York Little. City originally. That's right. He was a York City legend. They love him there, um, but he he kind of signed most you know, three, four, five players from York, and and one of you know two of the players were wingers, and I, I suddenly right. fell down the pecking yeah. order, and it was really frustrating actually because uh, I didn't think I deserved to to lose my spot. I'd, I'd been you know, I think one of the better players in the team, but it happened and it happens to players. And um, so, yeah, suddenly I was out of contract mm. and not really playing for South End. It weren't very good particularly. So my options were limited and um, yeah, I, I needed to sort of get, get a job, yeah. you know, I needed to, I needed to find a club. Um, so I, I uh, in the end, yes, yeah, Stevenage, uh, Paul Fairclough was the manager of Stevenage mm. and they were, they were, a top national league team at the time. Yeah. Excellent club. And um, yeah, I was holding out to try and get a move to a, you know, like a Leighton Orient or someone like that. Plymouth Argyle were interested. Yeah. And 
and I was just being held. I was being uh, kept at arm's length. You know, people were people were saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we're going to sort it. We're going to sort it." But I got yeah. that feeling that that it was going to drag on, and that if they could get their first choice. They would get yes. them, and I was yeah. I was a second choice, and just had that nagging feeling. And and to be honest, I fell out of love with it because I was like, "Do I want to do this? One year at Carlisle, one year at Rotherham, one year at you know wherever." I don't know. I didn't fancy it to be honest. Um, so yeah, Stevenage, very persistent. Paul Fairclough, he sold mm -hmm. sold the dream to me. He's, he's a great communicator, Paul, and um, mm -hmm. and he yeah he, he persuaded me to go to give up the pro game, go there semi-pro two mm. nights a week and 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 then I needed to get a job and that and it was the best thing that happened to me because then I I, I got into journalism and right. um and yeah the rest is history I'm still doing it so um, yeah yeah, but, but and, yeah and... Ju ju juggling the juggling the job with with playing for Stevenage was was really challenging in that first year I was so tired um such long days but but I love I probably enjoyed my time at Stevenage as much as I enjoyed it anywhere it was mm. great there's one aspect of your time at Stevenage which I'm going to pick up on um, because you, uh, you you may not remember what well, I assume you do remember this, but you went on loan to Hendon for a couple of games, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. I used to watch Hendon regularly because I lived in West Hampstead okay. and Claremont Road was literally five minutes drive. Yeah, and we used yeah. to go, obviously I'm a Palace fan, I was living with a Chelsea fan, and we used to go and watch Palace and Chelsea, but if they weren't, if you weren't, We'd mm. go to Claremont Road. Mm. What a great ground, unfortunately, no longer there. So mm. do you remember any of your time at Hendon? Yeah, briefly, yeah. So oh. again, I'd, I'd, I'd been a regular at South End for years. You know, it had gone really well. It was, it was a similar story, actually. And a new manager came in, Wayne Turner. And basically, he turned Stevenage into a full-time team. And I couldn't commit to, and he was doing daytime training. And I'm like, well, I can't come. I've got a job. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it, 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 I had to leave, really. Um, but we had a bit of a falling out because the fans... We're, we're getting the hump with him for not picking me because mm. you know I was reasonably popular at the time. I used to score quite a lot of goals and and uh, so basically he ostracised me completely and said I don't want you to come into the games anymore. Wow. Um, yeah, um, because they were saying you know they're giving him stick saying yeah, yeah. get me on. Um, so he basically wanted them to forget about me. So yeah, um, he put me on a training program on my own, uh, rock hard training program like just basically just running. Um, at a local gym, supervised by someone that to make sure I wasn't cheating. And he's just trying to break me um, so that I would cancel my contract. Um, so what happened was um, a number of National League managers reached out to me and said, what's happening? Um, we'll, we'll have you like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, all right then. And then, but they said, but you you need games. You know, you you not play for ages. You need games. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I said to the manager, I said, can you send me on loan? And he's like, yeah, but not to another club in this league. <laughs> so, you know, right. so yeah. And, and I said, but clubs lower down won't, won't be able to afford my wages. You know, Stevenage was a big club at that time. Really? I said, it's, it's obviously going to put people off. He said, tough. Um, so it was, it was real hard line. Yeah. So he, and then he, and then he came to me and said, look, Hendon will take you. They were top, I think of the, of the Ryman League at the time, yeah. which would be the equivalent of the Conference South now. And um, so they were a very good team. And uh, he said, they can only pay half your wages. Will you do it? And I said, all right, I'll do it. Yeah. And I went for a month and really enjoyed it. It was great. Um, yeah. The manager, Dave, um, Irish guy, um, he's a bit of a legend there. Um, he was um, he was excellent. He was, I can't remember his name now, but the yeah. it was a wonderful spirit at Hendon yeah. wonderful awesome. spirit and the thing that stands out to me is after training you had to you had to stay for at least one beer um <laughs> this is at Claremont Road is it yeah you I've been in that bar many times you had to stay if you didn't stay for at least one beer after training you were fine <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, I mean, this is obviously you know this was football in the in the sort of I don't know what it was uh, early two thousand. Yeah, um, yeah, very different to now. Dave Anderson, Dave Anderson, I think was a manager. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I remember Gary McCann, who became yeah. a manager because he was a goalkeeper at Hendon and got yeah. injured, mm -hmm. and he was a manager there for a very long time. But that was just slightly after that period. Yeah. No, I loved it there. I only played three or four games, and then and and. 
that they wanted to continue it and Stevenage obviously did as well. And then I said, nah, I said, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll cancel my contract. That's what you want. I'll, can I'll just cancel it. And he's like, where are you going? I said, no, don't worry about that. He yeah. said, no, no, where are you going? I said, I'm not telling you where I'm going, but no. I want to cancel my contract. So they did it. That's what he wanted. And um, so I signed for Margate, who were a, a very strong National League team at the time. Um, every bit as strong as Stevenage. And um, yeah, did the old um, met at a service station with the club secretary to sort of, you know, cancel the forms. Yeah. And they were asking, where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> And I said, Jesus. you'll find out soon enough. So they went to Margate. And of course, the first fixture that weekend was Margate at Stevenage, um, was, which yeah. is why I didn't want to tell them. And um, yeah, I went straight into the team, won 3-0. Uh, wow, yeah. well, you beat Stevenage 3-0 at their own victory, ground. Victory was that, sweet. Yeah. That must have been <laughs> so sweet. Did you talk to the manager afterwards? Who'd he tried to shake or? my hand. Yeah, that he went. He came gosh. to shake my hand, like no hard feelings. I think I shook it, but I didn't I didn't engage. Yeah, because I, I love Stevenage and I didn't want to leave. But I just yeah. thought there was a way, there's a better way to deal with people, you know, okay, I couldn't commit to daytime training. Um, but you know, that's, that wasn't my fault. He changed everything. So, um, he, he should have just, he should have helped me really yeah. to, you know, uh, we could have worked together to find yeah. a resolution, but instead he sort of went the old school way of just trying to sort of, um, force me out of the club, which, you know, it's a long time now, you know, if I saw him now, it'd, it'd be fine. But, yeah. but at the time, you know, I, I was, I was gutted because I, I didn't want to leave there. It was, it was, a, it was a lovely place to play. Um, but, but yeah, it had to be done, it, but it could have been done in a much, much nicer way. Well, you say old school, well, you look at Chelsea now with Chalabar and Gallagher and Lukaku, yeah. they're not, they're not training with the first team. That no. That's, that's tough love. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's football. Quite a lot of tough. Yeah. It's football. Yeah. When, a lot of players, a lot of players get a stick for yeah. not being loyal. You know, if a club comes in for them, you know, as a guy at Norwich and I, I've criticised him this week, Johnny oh, Rowe, you yeah, know, a club yeah. comes in for him. He doesn't want to play. And, you know, so he gets, he gets slaughtered for it. And actually he probably deserves to there, but okay. players get a lot of stick for not being loyal. But the, the truth is football clubs are every bit as, as disloyal to players who are under contract, mm. every bit as ruthless. When they decide, even if you're under contract, you've got two years left, if they decide you're not part of the plans, they'll get you out, even mm. if you don't want to. Um, most, of the case, most of the time you would want to, but um, yeah, football clubs can be brutal. And uh, I think they get away with that um, because fans are only really interested in the 11, you know, the here and now, who wants to stay, who wants to be part of it. But there are humans there that are, just unfortunately in the background that mm. really want to stay and play, but for one reason or another, they're being sort of frozen out. And that's not, it's not because they don't want to be there, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Football, football is a tough old business. It really is. Um, and yeah, that's, that kind of stuff still goes on. We see it all the time. Yeah. Right. I want to round us up and, and get to the, the finish point. Cause it's been, it's been fascinating um, taking us through your, career and also starting at Ipswich as a six-year-old. But uh, I wanted to just move on to that last first as a professional. So you were co-commentator at <laughs> Millwall Watford. I was, alongside, yes. Alongside, um, was it, who was the commentator? I wasn't actually in the country, but. <laughs> um, uh, Rob Palmer, Rob, Rob Palmer of Sky. Yeah, 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 he's great. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. how was that? Was that, was that, yeah. Like, do you get tense? Do you think, oh gosh, I've got to get ultra prepared for this? No, every single um, player. Yeah, because because I've I've been at the sort of journalist game for a while. You know, I've been a mm. broadcaster for so long now. I've commentated on so many games, mainly for Arsenal yeah. and Talksport, um, and others. But but yeah, I've done hundreds of games. But but yes, yeah, Sky Sports is the one. It's the one sort of big client I've never worked for, and it's obviously the the the, the big one and. Yeah, it's always frustrated me. I must confess that I've never really had an in. I haven't tried too hard to go there, but um, whenever I have, it's been like, oh yeah, 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 we we, we like you, blah blah blah. But then you never hear anything, and yeah, and sure. nothing happens. But yeah, this new Sky deal, obviously with the Sky yeah. um, Sky Sports Plus, opens up more matches. Um, it's not going to be every match every week, but there are going to right. be a lot of extra games. And and Sky have obviously, ex I suppose, expanded their portfolio of co-commentators and. 
and yeah they, they they asked me to do it and i was absolutely thrilled did i over prepare um i probably did prepare more for mm. this than i would have done for an arsenal game where i, I kind of you know, do it in my yeah. sleep yeah um and tv commentary is much harder in my opinion than radio commentary where you can just talk and talk and paint the pictures but with tv yeah. you have to add value you have yeah. to you, it's no point you just telling the, the the viewer what they've just seen you've yeah. got to explain why that happened and, and what they could have done better or, or worse and, and whatnot so um it's a, and you speak less so there's you really have to think about it but yeah it went well i really really enjoyed it and I had a cracking game what you know, a game three, wow three two, I mean... to, three two to watford two nil up yeah, Mill will fight back to a piece, and then and then Watford get the winner. It was a proper blood and thunder championship game. Some great goals in it as well. <laughs> a tough right. name to say, Chat for Tadze, the Georgian. <laughs> and but yeah, like yeah, you can watch the highlights back. I think you know there's three minute highlights. Like I appear on it more than I would have expected to. So and sounded all right. So yeah, hopefully it's gone all right. They're going to be sporadic. It's not gonna. I'm still gonna work yeah. for all the same people that I work for this season. Um, I'm a newbie, so I'm only going to get the odd the odd game um, this season. Um, just been booked actually for the next one, which will be Queens Park Rangers against Hull on okay. I think the first of October. So um, okay. yeah, got about six weeks to go to that one. Um, so yeah, I look, I look forward look forward to it. But yeah, great to be involved and mm. yeah, co commentating is the thing that gives me the buzz, the adrenaline rush wow. that that I miss from playing. It's the closest oh, really? it comes really. Yeah, I think okay. it is. Cause you, you know, this it's, it's an important job. You have to really think on your feet quickly. Um, and you're totally immersed in the game. You have to yeah. be. And, and it's, I think it's as close as, as you can get when you're not a player or a manager. So, um, yeah, yeah that, that, that's why I love it. And I, I, I just want to cling on and, and do as many co-commentaries for, for any clients as I can, you know, before I eventually pack it in when I get older. So, yeah, I just want to carry on doing it forever, basically. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And as you say, as an ex-player, you know, you can't keep playing forever. So that is the beautiful extension of your career. And, you know, yeah, very lucky. Or, yeah. It's without sparing, sparing, you know, I don't want to, you know, pump you up too much but I've always loved hearing you on commentary and all sorts of things so I think you know you've made the switch very smoothly from being an ex-player into the media so okay. thank you um, well done on that and, and, and that's great so I think it's a great place to finish because as you say your next co-com will be QPR Hull you made your debut coming on as a sub against QPR. <laughs> you made your full debut against QPR. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's it's been great going through all that career and starting at Portman Road when it started snowing and they had to clear the pitch when you were a six-year-old. So been a pleasure having you on. It started with a kick and uh, I wish you luck with uh, the co-commentary and with your, you know, your media career going forward. Uh, much appreciated, Rich. Yeah, uh, it's been great to be on the show. Thanks, Adrian.